Um, if there are any researchers in the room, however, anybody who considers them a kind of basic income researcher, I would just encourage you to go to the Citizens Basic Income Trust website. For my sins, I've been recently made the chair of Citizens Basic Income Trust. And one of the things we're doing at the moment is gathering everybody who's researching on basic income into one listing. So that was just a kind of quick heads up. And like, I, if I'm doing a presentation, I always like to say basically, uh, what am I going to say before I say it? So that's this is the summary. And the, the basic idea is that basic income piloting, uh, and I'm not saying it has no value, but I think there's a lot of evidence that basic income has lots of very positive impacts. Um, so I think what Caroline and I think is that it's time for us to start moving away from just talking about let's have another pilot to saying how can we actually create a basic income system and we're I mean this is a global issue but we're focusing on the UK how can we make this something that people believe is really doable we believe that the target for this shouldn't be basic income what I'm calling basic income simplex just that's it one basic income set at one level for everybody but we need something more sophisticated than that which actually Kate Pickett was just referring to um and once you start thinking like that you can start to I think pick a path for getting from where we are now to where we need to be I'm also throwing up very I'm again sorry for this but I just think not only have we got lots of evidence about pilots, we also have lots of evidence from people's experience of work and the benefit system of the damaging impact of means testing and controlling and sanctioning on people's health now. Uh, in fact, Rick and I worked on a project, didn't we, like nearly 10 years ago, looking at the damaging impact of the assessments done on people with disabilities to people's health and other outcomes and there's there's actually decades of data in occupational health on what the good can what conditions are necessary and one of my colleagues Anna Karin Fagelin Stahl from um from Sweden has uh, actually analyzed that data and, and presents a very interesting argument for basic income from that so just just uh, um what is universal basic income? What does it mean? Well, this is kind of our point of view. It means that the community says everybody should have enough to live on. And that means every single individual uh, should get money, enough money to live on. Um, that means you get money even if you're in a family. So you break away from just saying the breadwinner has all control of the money, but every individual member of the family gets money. Um, it means that you get it whatever your lifestyle choice, one of the most controversial issues, of course, but primarily in the UK context, that means you get it whether you're working, whether you're not working, whether you're seeking work, whether you're being a creative artist, whatever your strategy in life is, it, that's OK, because you you're a citizen with rights. Um, you get it with no means testing. That doesn't mean there's no means testing. It means the means testing is left to the taxation system. So you don't have two means testing systems. You have one and you try and organize a progressive means testing system to which we don't currently have in the UK. Uh, so we pay for it by paying taxes on our income. There are other suggestions about how we should do it. I'm a traditionalist. I like taxing the rich. I think it's actually good to redistribute income and therefore you need to take it off somebody. But that's another debate. Um, and very importantly and i would argue um and this is this is maybe controvert i mean there have been a lot of advocates for basic income historically who really loved the simplicity of it and that for people with disabilities or people who have spent a lot of their time working alongside people with disabilities that's kind of obviously a bit bonkers so actually just a super simple system is a bit stupid because it actually fails the test of sufficiency doesn't it because you actually sufficiency is something you need um, to be able to be more flexible around. And that's what the proposition that Caroline and I make. So that's the idea of uh, UBI plus is that people, everybody gets a basic income, but some people get some extra income. And um, Caroline led the thinking on the what we're calling the bolt-on approach. And so 
Uh, you can read more about this in the papers that we've published on this topic. We're not suggesting these are in any way final. Um, we, you know, we've struggled to get as much time to give to this issue as we'd like. But the kind of arguments we're making is that, for instance, if you are uh, if you have a disability, it's well known that you have extra costs to face just to, to reach a level playing field. That was always the point of disability living allowance, for instance. And disability living allowance actually has a kind of, if you get it, quite a UBI flavour because it isn't means tested. Um, but also arguably things that aren't related to disability, but also create extra needs are like living alone. Um, most people actually live with other people. That creates kind of significant efficiencies, but quite a lot of people don't live with other people. That makes life more expensive. In a sense, the house and the costs associated with that um, are costs you can't really avoid. Now, if the, if the basic income was incredibly generous, maybe you wouldn't worry about that. But in the real world, um, those things are real extra needs. That doesn't stop us being able to create a universal basic income solution for addressing those basic needs. Um, so the point of the last point is that all these elements like PIP or DLA, they can share the qualities that universal basic income has, which is basically the ones I explained, but no mean, means testing, no conditionality, et cetera. Now, this is a new slide I did for this talk to try and, I think, just pick up this issue, I think, what is a critical issue. So again, often people focus on um, this issue of means testing or this issue of conditionality. You should only give people benefits if they're desperately looking for whatever crappy job is out there, right? Well, that's not what advocates of basic income believe. But one of the other really important features of basic income is it's trying to break the patriarchal um, way in which income is distributed. At the moment, primarily earnings um, are going to the breadwinner. Sometimes there's more than one breadwinner in the household, of course, uh, and they may be of different genders or, or they may be the same gender. Um, but benefits are also organized to give power to that breadwinner, that, that person who's also getting the income. Uh, and so the, the rest of the members of the household, even whatever, whether they be children, whether they be carers, whether they be partners in some other situation, and, and this is true for many people with disabilities, actually get nothing because their partner is getting something or they get very little because their partner's getting something. So one of the great advantages of a UBI approach is it kind of, uh, and this is one of the reasons why actually it's very good defense against domestic violence, which is primarily committed by men against women. Again, not universally, but that is the absolutely dominant pattern. And it's primarily women who are, uh, in caring roles, and I think, again, there's a lot of evidence that if you're going to, instead of instead of making sure that it's, uh, the, instead of the man being in control of funding for children, and again, there can always be situations where it might be one or the other, but our default should surely be that it's women who are controlling the income for children, just because we know actually in a situation of domestic violence or need it's the woman who's most likely to be protecting the children and moving away with the children but we also need to have some kind of approach that is needs based not just straight so at the moment if you can imagine if we just have a really simple approach and we just say everybody gets the same actually that's massively beneficial for anybody who decides to live with other people okay and that isn't necessarily a bad thing but it isn't a terribly realistic thing in a world where some people are going to live alone. And it also gives rise to kind of weird distortions if you're moving from the old system to a new system of basic income. So we don't just need to think about things like disability. We also need to think about things like, you know, the other costs that people bear. And that's kind of the work that Caroline does shows that we can start to do that. Um, we, you know, it, just in terms of how we pay for all this, again, just very quick slides. Important to remember that everybody's on benefits, like benefits are distributed across our whole, the whole earning. It's kind of weird that actually the poorest people don't get the most. Um, and our benefit system is also um, full of things. Some of our benefit system, like job seekers allowance, 
uh, is extremely vicious and um but other bits of our benefit system like the state pension are very close to a basic income already so in many ways what we're trying to do is actually just move all of the benefit system onto a situation and you notice actually when you actually look at how much money is being distributed the the amounts that are super means tested aren't the biggest amounts overall this slide is just one that I like to use to try and help people understand how poorly we distribute resources at the moment. Basically, tax and benefits is a redistribution system. Its job is to move money from the rich to the poor. And at the moment, our system is so unfair that it barely distributes any money at all. Uh, again, this is when people say like the benefit system costs about 200 billion pounds. What they forget is almost all of that is paid back immediately through taxation. So actually, for, and the poorest, the poorest 10%, pay the highest percentage of their income in tax in any group. Actually, about 50% of their income is lost in tax immediately. So when you actually take tax into account, benef the benefit system is actually doing very little real re re redistribution. So as this slide shows, actually it's the equivalent of the richest 70% giving 90p per day to the poorest 30%. What basic income does is it's, in my head, uh, and I think if, if it's paid through progressive taxation, it basically takes money from the richest 20% and redistributes it to the rest of us. But interestingly, one of its effects is also to redistribute money to people who are maybe inside richer families as well as poorer families because it's giving money to children to disabled people to carers to older people who may well be excluded um, from in the current system and again a very like a technical point but really one worth hanging on to in debates about basic income is the pivot point certainly if you're paying for basic income through progressive taxation the pivot point is inevitably the mean income the mean income is the not the middle income, which is a much lower figure. It's the figure you get when you divide all of the earned income by all the people. And that's quite uh, that actually that is around the 20, 20, 80 to 20 percent. So 80% of us are below the mean income, only 20% are above the mean income. And that's why it has this kind of redistributory effect. So very quickly, these are just some thoughts about, uh, I mean, last year's Basic Income North Conference, actually Andy Burnham came to speak. And one of the reasons I'm giving this talk really is a, is a kind of positive response to what Andy said. So he said, oh, well, we, you know, we can see basic income is the way forward, but we just can't see how to get from A to B, from the system we have to the system we want. I suppose what Caroline and I think and have been arguing is that actually we probably can if we use a little bit of a, um, imagination if we start to analyze the issues and break them down there's a whole series of steps we could take um, so again i'm going to really you know integrating tax and national insurance reforming housing benefit and support for mortgage interest creating entitlements for people who currently don't earn that's a technical thing you'd have to have people kind of signed up to this system ending exclusions for refugees and migrants, ending the two-child cap, for instance, on families would just be things you'd have to do, um, but are very, very doable. You'd um, move, I think, Caroline has argued, I think very intelligently that if you use Joseph Roundtree, for instance, art, use minimum income standards to define what is a reasonable level of income for everybody. So if that's our goal, then you could just start moving to those things. You don't need to do it overnight. You can do it in a staged way. And I think very importantly, we'd need something like a basic income review body that allowed representation for key groups. So people with disabilities, for instance, should be represented on that review body and, and data should be gathered to see how this system is going. So, the problem then breaks into basically three groups, uh, and I'm going to quickly skip through the these. Again, integrating child benefit and universal ch credit child payments actually would create quite a significant um, basic income for children. 
I would say make the mother the default manager for children UBIs, arguably make the payment for each child the same at the moment. The first child is getting the most, the second child less, and then uh, older children starting to be excluded from at least the universal credit payments. Um, remove the taxable status of child benefit. So actually that that's a benefit for the rich, but they'll that will be made up for by increased progressive taxation. Uh, but if you want to you want to have the universality. Um, and the net effect will be to radically reduce or end child poverty. But it will mean that more people, especially childless high earners, will be those people will pay high in taxes. That's what redistribution means. Um, older people, again, you could try and combine pension credit and state pensions. You could get rid of the contributory principle, which is irrelevant to basic income. Uh, and the net effect, again, would be to reduce poverty for older people, uh, but to increase taxes on richer older people. For working age adults, and you could end sanctions. Again, these are, these are specific policies that you could introduce separately, but as part of a plan. You could, again, create entitlements for non-earning partners. You could universalise job seekers allowance. So that would be a very quick win. Make sure everybody got that. Uh, obviously, that level of that needs to go up. You can uh, end, end the current or reduce the current tax allowance. You end means testing for benefits. Another very straightforward step towards um, moving from the current system to a system of UBI plus would be just say everybody who gets ESA now, actually no conditionality, no means testing. That's, that is effectively equivalent of a some kind of UBI plus. Again, I'm not saying it's a perfect level, but it would immediately move us into the right direction um, and convert PIP and DLA into a disability bolt-on. So that was my very quick run through. I'll see this, I'll let me get rid of this, uh, excuse me. And Caroline, do you wanna just kind of, I don't know, pick up things? We've got 25 minutes. So do you wanna say a little bit and then we just have questions and see where the discussion takes us? Um, I don't think I do. I th I'll tell you why. I think people will be champing at the bit now to um, ask the questions, to fill in the gaps that they're experiencing, as opposed to me trying to um, predict what it is that they're thinking. Um, so let, let's ask, ask the people in the room. Okay. Who would like to speak first then? Uh, Claire. Um, thanks very much, Simon and Caroline. Um, it's good to it's good to hear about um, plus because that was always a concern of ours about basic income that it would actually be lower than the current um, disability benefit entitlements. And um, we found with the Roundtree minimum levels that um, you know there've been quite a lot of consultations and sort of claimants discussion and then you end up with something that's actually quite low which you know is not what we're aiming for and um when when Eleanor Rathbone campaigned for family allowance which became child benefit she as far as I understand it she envisaged that each each member of the family should get their own entitlement and the child benefit was only the start because she wanted mothers to be recognised for the work of bringing up children and looking after families. And I appreciate that some people are saying that that's, um, you know, a backward view of women's work, but it is reality for um, most women. Um, including like career women who then have a baby and then they suddenly realise, oh, mothers are not recognised and I really resent that because here I am struggling <laughs> and um, have a sort of revelation about mothers. Um, so, I mean, we we support the Global Women's Strike Call for a care income for carers of all genders who are looking after people and planets, starting with mothers so it's not it's not like a basic income 
to lift you out of poverty only. It's recognition. It's recognition of the contribution you're making to society. Society, and as women with disabilities, we feel strongly we're having to struggle in an inaccessible, discriminatory world. It's very hard work, and we we need to have that work recognised with with a, an income and also have that workload reduced by access, um, assistance, services of our choice, um, you know, to actually cut down the work that we have to do. So our sort of approach is more recognition of the contribution that women and people are making and recognise that and start with caring work and the relationships that we want. And obviously it would be great to abolish um, sanctions and, and condition, the conditionality of benefits, which is destroying people's lives and um, affecting people's mental health and so on. Um, but, you know, starting from recognition of, of women and mothers and child poverty is related to mothers' poverty. And, um, you know, they go on about the employment gap, but they don't talk about the pay gap for disabled people, especially disabled women who are the lowest, have the biggest gap in pay. Thanks, Claire. I mean, I think I, I certainly agree with all of that. I didn't see, I think Caroline and Matt, I didn't see whose hand went up first. Did, sorry. Did, Caroline, would you uh, want yeah, to respond just, specifically to something Claire had said and then? Yeah, I, I do. And um, I hear you, Claire. And I remember Simon and I speaking um, together uh, at a fringe event at Labour Conference. And Simon was on the panel and I spoke to the floor and I uh, specifically said, you know, at what point are we rewarding mothers for being mothers? and compensating them for um, the time that they have to take out of careers and industry and work in general. So that's why we included um, in our UBI Plus that when people are um, unable to work, for whether it's because they're short or long-term sick, or whether they're caring, whether they're caring for children, caring for um, a disabled family member, relative, um, older person, most of this always falls on women. And we know that women then get worse pensions because of it. They lose pension contributions because of it. They aren't at, can't save. And this also goes back to this UBI simplex that you spoke about at the very beginning, Claire, where it was like, it's one amount. And I think Simon will agree with me. We spoke to the Basic Income Earth uh, Network World Conference. And we were both in other groups looking and listening. And of course, I heard it from the position of, it was an awful lot of men telling an awful lot of everybody else how um, 50, 60, 75 pounds, just give it to everybody and that will cure all the problems. And it's like, no, it won't. It will not do any sort of redistribution and it has no recognition for people who aren't 20 something, 30 something, degree educated, high flying, good earning, even middle earning, poor earning. But these are men who literally a man's life goes like this, get born, be looked after, grow up, get educated, get married. Someone else then has a baby. You then carry, men then carry on in work and then they retire and they retire with pensions. There's nothing normally or historically or intrinsically biologically that slams men. Women's journey is totally different because you're young and then you develop periods and all the problems that periods bring and then you get married and then you have a baby and that messes with your career and then you're looking after children and then you're hitting the menopause and then you're looking after parents and then you're a grandparent looking after grandchildren 
the things that stop women earning and progressing are totally different to men. Hence, this is why UBI Simplex, the very straightforward one-off payment comes about is it's not anybody being particularly nasty. It's because the certain sectors of society don't experience all the hurdles in life. And um, I'm sure there's lots of men in this room who no one understand these hurdles. It's not you I'm talking to. It is. It was just this overriding feeling at what was the world conference of an awful lot of men doing the exact opposite to what they thought they were doing. So, yeah, UBI Plus, our UBI Plus, recognises the hiccups in the road and the additional costs and the barriers and the things that, that really drive inequality, financial inequality, opportunities. We are trying to recognise all those. Sam recognises him because he's a good, well-rounded human being, and I recognise him in the role of victim. <laughs> so we're with you, Claire. We've got it covered, we hope. <laughs> but, so, um, Matthew, Matthew, what would you like to well, say? Well, I, uh, I, I, think, I think kind of you've, you've got it covered. My, my worry and my question here is that, that my... My perspective on this is that the, the cruelty inbuilt into our welfare systems is a feature rather than, than a bug. And I think that certainly the current government are intentionally cruel on people and they know, they know full well what cruelty they're inflicting on people. I haven't massively got more confidence in the shadow, you know, kind of the shadow government. Um, and... I suppose in, in, in kind of what you presented in the ways of paying for it, I was wondering whether there's anything that could actually be employed on a on a regional scale, because I guess that's where, where I, the only level at which I've got faith that, that like some, some people would actually want to do something. You know, we we mentioned the uh, the the Welsh government, um and yeah, kind of and this as this is a as this is a northern conference, my 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 question is: Is there any hope for the north north of the uh, north of the UK? Can we have enough de devolution to to do something? Here? Yeah, I mean that's a good question, Matt, isn't it? And I think currently, no no northern authority has anything like the powers necessary. Uh, the other week, I was working with uh, folk in Manchester exploring some pilots that could be done around homelessness. Uh, because there is a bit of so, but they would be like pilots, not a kind of systemic change in tax and benefits. Simply, you know, I'm in in my life, although my family come from Manchester, I'm I'm busy in a group called Democratic Yorkshire. I, I, personally, I'd I, I would probably prefer independence for the north, but it doesn't seem very likely to happen. But um, if we, you know, we need those kind of powers. I would agree. That I just like, but I would like to make a point about. I mean, exactly what you, you're absolutely right. You know, like if if the if the to put it crudely, if the Tories were fans of basic income, I wouldn't be. I mean, I'd be really worried, given where their ideological position is, and and I don't see it as part of my life's work to run around trying to please right wing politicians. Um, but if we're going to make the change in society that we want, whether it's super local or whether it's national or whether it's global, because um, again, you know, these issues, uh, you know, are, are real in, in Africa and India and everywhere else today. It's the same issue. Um, we, we don't just like when you say like people, not you, but like sometimes, well, you know, we need a shift. What a, a change. Well, what, what will that be? Part of what Imi Cow was saying, I think, is going to be part of it. Some of it's going to be driven by absolute breakdown. Some of it is going to be driven by um, younger people who have more progressive views. Some of it's going to be driven by lived experience. But some of it is going to be driven by, this is my view, people saying, you know what, we could do this. And, and, and the fact that things start to feel possible becomes one of the ways in which you can move the debate. Um, and I mean, the NHS is a good example of this, and it has all these aspects to it. It was the 
Socialist Medical Association in 1922, who first wrote down something that said, this is what we should do. And it took 23, no, 25 years actually to get from there. But we had a world war. And we also had, if you look into the detail, the health service in the mid in the early 40s was just in a complete mess. Like hospitals were private hospitals were also falling over. Like the they the the funding system for the system that existed didn't work. Do you see what I mean? So there are a lot of things that are going to have to happen for us to bring about these changes. Uh, and I, we shouldn't be naive, exactly as you say, about a government like the kind of one we have, which is one of the most right-wing governments in the world, giving us nice things, giving us respecting human rights. They cannot respect human rights for their own citizens. They cannot respect human rights for migrants. Why would they implement an idea like this? But we need to organize for the change we want to see. Um, and I think this is one of those ideas. What it does require, and what's been lacking, and what Caroline's touching on really, is that a lot of people talking about basic income historically have been white men, academics, middle class, totally detached from the reality of people's lives. So that's what Caroline and I are trying to do, is not just offer a different idea, but actually can we bring people with disabilities into the conversation? Because they have, I think, just rationally, if you look at what the, the logic of this, massive amounts of gain from it. Sorry, I think, I again, I missed waffling, whether it was Rick or Colin who had the hand up next. Anybody help me? Or any, I'll just do it round. Colin, Colin is next. Colin, Colin, would you like to go next? You need to unmute Colin. Yeah, a couple of contradictions to what you said, but basically I agree totally with UBI Plus as you've explained it. Um, I live in Cambridge here, and Cambridge has got the, one of the widest um, dis uh, disparities between the rich and the poor. Um, so I hope you'll include me in your northern um, group. Um, you also mentioned the right wing, of course. I first heard about uh, basic income when I heard, I think it was Rutger Bregman, interviewed by Jeremy Vine on the radio, and I read his book, and he refers to Richard Nixon, who wanted to introduce uh, UBI in the uh, 70s, I think it was. Um, and it didn't get through because the Democrats voted against it. But I've also progressed from there to Yanis Varoufakis and um, your own guy standing. And you talk about um, the, the taxation to pay for this uh, income tax. But I get the, the feeling that this could be done, both uh, Varoufakis and guy standing have intimated on intimated this sort of thing, that um, corporations get a lot of exemptions from tax and um, Verifarka suggests a five pound skim off of all corporations for all their income for more than pay for UBI and um, I think you know you've, nobody's mentioned that as an alternative source of income to pay for UBI and um, what else was going to say before I depart um, yeah I'm with the Green Party in Cambridge and I'm trying to get them to push the um, UBI at the forefront of their general election manifesto. Um, we Obviously, you need the support of other parties to get this through, but it's to create an expectation. And if you publicise the what UBI will be, people might start to say, well, what's this UBI? Can't we have that? You know, is it affordable? Yes, it's affordable. And all the other, I think Guy Standing's uh, guide to this, he answers all the points um that um the criticism uh, thrown against ubi but um yeah but basically it's certainly in support of it and um one of the things i mean i'm very much concerned with um the climate and the um the threat there but the first thing people are concerned about is putting bread in their families mouths and keeping warm and dry so yeah ubi is the first way to deal with that i think the best way to deal with that and then move on to the um the other issue of the climate. That's it. That's all. Rick, thank you, Colin. That's great. Rick. Hi. Uh, so, well, first of all, before I forget, um, so I'm here representing the Great Manchester Sale Peels panel. We are doing some work with Andy Burnham about disability benefits in Greater Manchester, and you are mentioned in the briefing. So here I'm officially inviting you. 
uh, could we arrange a meeting to talk about the things that we are thinking and plotting about in Greater Manchester? I, I'm very happy to do that, Caroline. Oh, you got, you got, you're muted. I'm sure Caroline would be up for that. Yeah. From a, at least from yeah, a, I, I didn't know you. The, the, the invite was extended to me as well. But yeah, yeah I'm always up for it, Rick. Always. Okay, cool. And just to, to say, so we recently had um, a thing in Manchester, Greater Manchester, joining up social justice and climate justice. And in fact, you can see Elaine Morgan here. She's one of the key organisers of that. And and I think one thing that came from that is actually that these, these things aren't in opposition at all. So, for example, you know, you said people are worrying about, you know, food on the table, their, their electricity bills. Uh, we can, you know, we can find ways to link the policy that deals with climate crisis with the thing that provides food and makes houses more efficient. And so they're not in opposite. They're actually working together. And, it, and I think that is a key thing that we don't see these things as separate struggles that you know, and it, when we talk about, and it's, you know, UBI plus, and I think it's really important that we are talking about UBI plus, because to be frank, there is a, a wide spectrum of what is considered UBI in the world. And and some of them are really, they are white, cis male <laughs> um, inventions, and they just, there's no disabled people in their world. There's no mothers in their world. Um, so I think this is really, really important that, you know, this and the other intersectional uh, aspects and you know, yeah, and that the under the underlying necessity of of a system that is going to be robust to get us through very difficult climate situation. But um, yeah, it's been really great to have this. It's a show, p pity it wasn't in person in Manchester; it would have been really fantastic. But um, brilliant, uh, we'll have that follow up yeah. chat, and um, this is all really encouraging. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Rick. I mean, oh, Elaine wants to speak as well. I, well I, um, I just wanted to say about this relates a bit to your point, but also Claire's point. One of the things that excites me about basic income is it's kind of allows us to start questioning what we value in life. Like it basically the current system says what's valuable is whatever the exchange system of labor um, says is valuable. And that's bullshit. The exchange system of labor is destroying our, our world. I mean, that system really is broken. So we need to give ourselves permission to start saying things like, you know what the most important work in the world is? Being a mother, taking care of people. You know what the second is? Taking care of the planet. You know, those kind of things. Like, that. we need to revalue this. And, and that's what basic income is a, is a route to, I think. But sorry, Elaine, not... Um, yeah, no, just a couple of things for me, really. I think the other benefit of UBI is around sort of the ability to allow people to retrain. I think we're struggling in Greater Manchester at the moment and probably across the country in terms of recruitment into certain sort of industries, especially around caring industries, um, support to give people advice. We're really struggling with welfare advice workers, DWP, um, even though that might be a dirty word. Um, but, you know, I think it's just that ability to allow people to actually say, I really want to do something that would help other people, but I just can't afford to retrain and, and move out of my current job. So I think, you know, there's some benefits towards that. I think on a, what worries me slightly is that, you know, current government, you know, you've got, we've got no chance, but it just worries me sometimes, I think, around what I'm Look, hearing from yeah. the shadow government now, um, around, you know, the refusal to drop the, the two-child benefit cap, etc. Um, and it's just worrying for me about, you know, there was a bit of hope there that a general election next year might we might gain some trajectory, but whether or not that's the case anymore. Um, so, you know, it's just putting it out there about what could we do if, you know, a new government is, you know, basically saying very similar to this government. I think what I'm hoping for, Elaine, is that what the UBI movement does. I mean, we're working behind the scenes at the moment to get our act together. There are quite a lot of different groups that need to come into harmony. And I think we're getting there. Um, but also why we need to be building bridges with things like the disability movement. Positive social change comes when people come together around good ideas. And at the moment, we're nowhere near that, not just in the basic income movement. We're nowhere around near it on disability are we we're nowhere near it on social care on so many fronts groups are fragmented um often fighting over 
side issues rather than working together to offer a more positive picture of the world we need to live in. Um, I think basic income needs to be part of that. I think basic income plus is an essential way of picturing that. But there's also just like a politics to it. It was interesting, however, more encouraging is that almost every political party, including large parts of the Labour Party, have now expressed support for basic income. The Lib yeah. Dems, the Green Party, all the, all the parties in Northern Ireland are now saying they're for it. Almost all the parties in Scotland, the Welsh Labour Party, the Scottish Labour Party. So, yeah, the London Labour Party seems to be rather stuck. <laughs> and, and there are a, a few Northerners, but not many in the mix, aren't there? I mean, you know, that's that's part of the, that's a big challenge for us. But yeah. and what I just will change well, is if we change, I think. Sorry, Elaine. No, I was just about to say, you know, UBI is a really big, you know, something really big to implement. But, you know, I've been working on campaigns around increasing the uptake of pension credit, um, how to start vouchers, free school meals. And actually, it's the fact that people have to apply. The government have that data for people who are eligible and they just won't allow auto-enrolment. And, you know, it's, it's just something as simple as that yeah. could actually benefit so many people. £73 million pounds unclaimed in Greater Manchester on pension credit, £5 million unclaimed in Healthy Start vouchers. I mean, that's something to me is so simple that the government could do something with now for people who are eligible, not just the universal basic income, it's what they're entitled to and they have the data on but they're having to make people jump through hoops all the time to get this money. So I just find it, you know, there are things that maybe, you know, I just find really difficult and strange with this government that what they can't, you know, they won't support. Cool. We've got like 50, 48 seconds, it says now. Gordon, right. was there something really you could say really quickly? It was just to say that, you know, my, my son is, is transgender, ODHD, uh, disabled wheelchair user, everything else. So UBI Plus is, is absolutely the way to go. Um, but it is that universality that it's important. It needs to have the redistributive aspect. I put this comment in the chat earlier um, because otherwise it's like, well, why should the rich get it? Well, it gets clawed back. And actually, if you earn above a certain amount, you actually end up paying more than you receive. So it nets out. It's much simpler. Tax system is already in place. Um, but I think as we get the uh, sort of AI coming in and it starts distributing those higher income workers, those white collar workers that have previously been shielded from uh, some of the stuff that um, automation disrupts, I think that's where we'll see it. Thank you, Gordon.